The fact is, Jesus will return and Jesus will reign with the saints. That's the bigger picture. So, the question is, how are we preparing to reign with Jesus in his kingdom? What's up, everybody? It's so good to be with you. Typically, I'm on the other side of things. I'm usually hosting our online service, but today I have the great honor of uh, bringing the message to you, and so I'm totally excited about that. Hope you all had a great Thanksgiving. Um, I can't believe we are already past Thanksgiving, and now we're heading into Christmas and the new, the new year. Um, you know, if you've been with us for a while, you know that over this past year, we have been in the middle of a series, a year-long series called One Story. And we have been reading through the Bible together. And each week we've been reading through key stories of the Bible. And on the weekends, we've been teaching through one of those stories. And as we've been coming through this year, we've realized that this accumulation of stories in the Bible actually tells one story, the story of Jesus. It tells his story. And today we begin the final segment of this series. Can't believe we're already here, but we are. And it is appropriately named The End of His Story. Uh, I know, a lot of creativity in that one, but we are at the end of his story. And today, we're gonna be looking at the last book in the Bible. So we started this thing clear back in January with the very first book of the Bible, Genesis. Now we're wrapping it up with the last book of the Bible, the book of Revelation. Not Revelations, Revelation. And uh, this is officially called the Revelation of Jesus Christ. And this book is a vision from Jesus Christ to his apostle John, and the bulk of which is unveiling of future events. In fact, that word revelation means to unveil or to reveal. And those future events, all of which have not happened yet, um, things like what Jesus called the Great Tribulation and uh, a series of judgments upon the world and upon the nations that pour out during that time period, and the emergence of the Antichrist and his false um, government and false religion. And we also see uh, the, re, uh, the, the persecution of the nation of Israel and the amazing revival of the nation of Israel. All of this climaxing with the events that we're gonna be looking at today. And I know when I, we talk about Revelation, I know many people are intimidated by the book of Revelation. And I get it, man. It's a, it's a weird book. It's a freaky book. Um, it's sometimes hard to understand. It's filled with prophecy. It's filled with allegory and symbolism. Uh, it can be a little confusing, a little scary. Uh, you know, so a lot of times it's referred to by its Greek name, the apocalypse. Every time I hear the word apocalypse, all I think about are zombies. Uh, so I don't, I don't know how that all works out, but that kind of freaks you out when you think about Revelation. Not to mention, it's got a variety of interpretations. A lot of God-loving, Jesus-following, sincere, good people sincerely disagree about the interpretation of this book. And there are several theological camps that, that look at this book in a different way. And so today, we're going to focus on events that I think every theological camp can agree on, at least I hope. We're gonna focus on three things today that I think we're all in agreement about. If you're a follower of Jesus and you know the book of Revelation, we're gonna see that Jesus will return to the earth to defeat his enemies. We're gonna see that Jesus will reign with his saints, and we're gonna see that Jesus will judge the world. Jesus will return, Jesus will reign, Jesus will judge. I think we can all agree on those three, three events. And you know, when it comes to prophecy, um, many people just wanna avoid it. And I understand that too. Now, a lot of people just wanna dive headlong into it, but lots of people just wanna avoid it. Like, man, just let me read the parts of the Bible that are you know, relational and tell me how to live and to make me feel good and all that, which is fine, that's fantastic, it's awesome, but here's the problem with it. You can't read the Bible and avoid prophecy. Because 25%, actually over 25% of the Bible is prophecy. It's predictive. The majority of it having to do with the events that we're gonna be talking about today. Let me give you some quick stats when it comes to prophecy in the Bible. You know, there are over 350 prophecies of Jesus's first coming, all of which came true, by the way, which is freaky in itself. 350 prophecies of the first coming, Prophecies about the second coming outnumber those of the first coming to a tune of eight to one. For every one prophecy of the first coming, there are eight 
for the second coming. In the New Testament, seven out of every 10 books refer to the return of Jesus Christ. That means that one out of every 30 verses that you read in the New Testament teach that Jesus is coming. You can't read the Bible and avoid prophecy. If you've been with us in this one story adventure over the last year, you've been in it. And it's mainly been pointing to the events that we're looking at today, which I think are, uh, is one of God's favorite things. So the Bible is littered with prophecy. What's, what's my point in all the stats and all the figures? It's simply this. Prophecy is a pretty big deal to God. This event particularly that we're looking at today, it's a pretty big deal to God. Shouldn't it be a big deal to us? Should the thought of Jesus returning change my life in some way? Should it change my perspective on life? Should it change my plans? Should it change my goals? Should I be feeling some way about the return of Jesus Christ? And how should I be preparing for this? Well, that's what we're gonna focus on today as we look at the end of his story. So, let's jump in. We're gonna be looking at Revelations chapter 19 and 20 today. So if you wanna follow along in your Bible, you can do that. Revelation 19 and 20. Now I'm gonna give you a little disclaimer here. Um, there is gonna be so much left unsaid today. So much left on the table. So many questions that you're gonna have as we come through these passages. We could literally do a deep dive into every single verse that I'm gonna to read today and spend hours. But we don't have hours. We don't have that kind of time. So for our purposes today, we're gonna to kind of keep that 30,000 foot perspective and we're gonna keep our focus on the three things. The first thing being Jesus will return to defeat his enemies. Jesus will return to earth to defeat his enemies. So let's check that out. We see this pictured for us in Revelation chapter 19, starting in verse number 11. It says there in verse 11, now I saw heaven opened and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on him was called faithful and true, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. In verse number 12, it says, his eyes were as a flame of fire, and his, on his head were many crowns, representing supreme authority. And he had a name written that no one knew except himself, which is getting ready to be revealed right now. And he was clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies of heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. Now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, and with it he should strike the nations. And he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. He himself treads the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And finally, it says in verse 16, and he has on his robe and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. That's the name he had that he had not made known yet. Well, now he's revealed it, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Now, this passage is obviously describing Jesus and his return to earth with his saints. Now, this is much different than his first coming. This is not the sacrificial lamb that we see in the Gospels who endured the wrath of God for our sin. The sacrificial lamb who took the wrath of God upon himself in place of us, and he took it upon the cross so that we could be set free. This is the conquering lion, returning to restore justice and righteousness to the earth and bringing the wrath of God with him. Totally different scenario. Jesus will return to the earth to defeat his enemies. Now, the question is, how are we preparing for his return? Whether you're a Jesus follower or not, there's some preparation that needs to happen for his return. And Jesus spoke often of his return. In the Gospels, uh, you see him talking a lot about uh, the return or his return. A lot of times it's direct. Like he's just saying directly, here's what's gonna happen. I'm coming back. Here's some details about that. But sometimes, he talks about it in the form of parables. And parables are stories that reveal heavenly truths through relatable earthly examples so that people could kind of connect with them. And he told parables about his return, um, not just to inform people about the future, 
but to prepare his listeners to live in the present because of what was coming in the future. And that's what we see in a parable in Luke chapter number 19. You don't have to go there. Just write this reference down for later. I'll just tell you the story. But in Luke chapter 19, uh, we see Jesus telling a parable about his return. And um, in this parable, we've got several characters. And beside the character that represents Jesus, there are three other characters and that we could pe- all of us, each of us could potentially identify with. And they are the good servant, the wicked servant, and the rebellious citizen. Good servant, wicked servant, rebellious citizen. So as we go through the story together, maybe as you're listening, think, man, who do I I identify with? Good servant, wicked servant, rebellious citizen. So the story goes like this in Luke chapter 19. Jesus tells his listeners, he says, hey, there was a certain nobleman, uh, basically a a landowner or a governor of a province. The certain nobleman, went away to a far country to receive his kingdom and to return. And he said, he called his servants together and he gave them money. It says he gave them minas, which is a, a form of money. And he said he gave them 10 minas each. Let's just, let's just call it dollars for our sake. He gave them each $10. And this is what he said to him. He said, I want you to do business until I come back. He said, I want you to put this money to work until I come back. In other words, I'm investing in you and I'm expecting a return on this investment. I'm expecting you to increase my business, to expand my enterprise, to generate profits with the money that I'm giving you. So that's the first part of the story. What's the application of that? Well, first of all, Jesus is that nobleman that is going to go to a far country, heaven, to receive a kingdom and ultimately to return. But before he leaves, he gathers his servants and he gives them resources to do his business. Now, in our case, if you're a follower of Jesus, Jesus has given each one of us some resources to do his work on this earth while he's away. He's given us his spirit. And with his spirit, he's given us power. He's given us gifts. He's given us abilities. Um, He's given us grace and mercy and forgiveness. All these things so that we might do his business until he comes back. And he is expecting a return on his investment. Now, what business is Jesus in? What is our king's business? Well, he's in the family business. He's in his father's business. He's in the kingdom expansion business. You know, I used, to have a, I used to have a friend of mine who used to always tell me, don't tell me my business. Uh, Jesus is telling us our business, uh, and there is business to be done. We should be involved in the kingdom expansion business, increasing the kingdom of God, sharing the gospel, making disciples, showing his love to the world. That's the business that Jesus' followers are to be in, and we've been resourced to do it by Jesus himself. Now, Jesus is coming. Our king is going to return to the earth with his kingdom. How are we to prepare for his return? By doing his business. So question, what business is consuming your life right now? What business is consuming your life these days? What business is consuming my life? Is it kingdom business or is it Kent business? Is it it heavenly or is it earthly? Is it eternal or is it temporal? Not that we don't have things that we need to do in this earth. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about what consumes us. What is above all? What is the priority? What business is the priority of our life? Our King Jesus is coming back. What business is he going to find me engaged in? So that's the first thing. Jesus is going to return to this earth to defeat his enemies. Second component of all this is that Jesus will reign with his saints for a thousand years. Jesus will reign with his saints for a thousand years. We see this uh, revealed for us in Revelation chapter 20, starting in verse number one. It says, Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, having the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold of the dragon, that that serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, no question about who this is, and bound him for a thousand years. And he cast him into the bottomless pit 
and shut him up and set a seal upon him so that he should deceive the nations no more until the thousand years were finished. But after these things, he must be released for a little while. And I saw thrones and they that sat upon them and judgment was committed to them. And, they, and, and then I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus and for the word of God and who had not worshiped the beast or his image and had not received his mark on their foreheads or on their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. They, meaning followers of Jesus, the saints, lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. Now, again, there is a ton of stuff that we could unpack here. Lots of stuff that we could unpack, but we need to keep our focus where it needs to be focused. Let's keep our focus on the big picture that Jesus is going to defeat his enemies, including uh, the nations who oppose him, including the Antichrist, including the devil himself, and he will reign with his saints for a thousand years. Now that thousand years, some believe that to be an, a literal thousand years, and they see all this as sequential. Jesus is gonna return, he'll reign for a thousand years, then he'll judge everyone. Some see the thousand years as symbolic of Christ's total reign and authority, and they see uh, his return to defeat his enemies and judgment as just two different angles to that event. Either way, however you see it, whatever theological camp you're in, the fact is Jesus will return and Jesus will reign with his saints. That's the bigger picture. So question is, how are we preparing for the, uh, to reign with him? How are we preparing to reign with Jesus in his kingdom? So going back to our story in, in Luke 19, uh, Jesus continues telling the story. He says that the nobleman went away, went to the far country to receive his kingdom. He said, now the nobleman, nobleman returns having received the kingdom and he calls his servants to account. And he asks them, he says, how much did you gain by trading? How much money did you make? How much did you invest and what did you get out of those investments? And so the first servant comes to him and says, you know what, master, I, you gave me $10 and I made 10 more. And the master, the king, Jesus, he says, well, good job. Well done, good servant. Why don't you, because you've been faithful in so little, how about you have authority over 10 cities in my kingdom? Next servant comes along and says, you know what, you gave me 10, I made five more. He says the same thing to him. Well done, good servant. You've been faithful in, in very little, so why don't I give you authority over five cities in my kingdom? You see here that the faithfulness and the reward kind of lines up with each other. And then finally, you have the last servant who shows up and he says, well, you know, I didn't do anything with your, your money. In fact, I just kept it for you. I hid it so I could keep it safe and I, I didn't do anything with it. I didn't put it to work. And the king looks at him and says, you wicked servant, you knew what I expected and you did nothing. Now, what's the application? Well, um, first of all, this is not about the rewards. Before we start thinking about, okay, this is about what I'm gonna get one day when Jesus comes back and I'm in his kingdom. No, no, it's not about the rewards. It's about the king and his kingdom. That's what this is about. It's about the glory that the king receives by rewarding his servants. And the more reward, the more glory. It's about the king. Now, the good servants are the ones who are faithful to put their resources to work doing the king's business while he's away. They're faithful to serve, to sacrifice, to surrender, to suffer for the kingdom's sake. And as a result, they glorify their king with the rewards when they reign with him. You know, Paul, when he wrote his letter to Timothy, the second letter to Timothy, he said in 2 Timothy 2.12, he said, if we suffer with him, we will also reign with him. If we suffer with him now, as his followers, we will reign with him then. And just a quick word about suffering. When, I, when, we, when he says suffering here, that doesn't necessarily mean physical persecution or attack, although it could and it does. Uh, even today in this world, we have followers of Jesus who are being persecuted for their faith physically. But it also means other things like uh, self-sacrifice, self-denial, surrender for the kingdom and for the gospel's sake. 
what Jesus said to take up our cross and to follow him. 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse number 6 puts it this way. Peter says, If we humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God, he will exalt us in a proper time. If we humble ourselves as his servants now, we'll be exalted in a proper time. But not for us, for him. Not for our glory, not for our reward, but for his reward. And then finally, we have the wicked servant. The wicked servant represents followers of Jesus. He's still a servant of the king. He's still a servant of the king. He, he represents good people, God-loving people, good, you know, salt of the earth, church-going folk who do nothing to increase the kingdom of God. They do nothing to increase his kingdom. They don't do anything bad necessarily. They just don't do anything. They don't do anything to see that the king is glorified both now and then. They're not doing kingdom work. They're not doing the king's business. Nothing to glorify God and no reward to show for it. So do you identify with any of these servants, the good servant, the wicked servant? Can I just tell you personally, um, I can identify with both of these. I can identify with both. There have been times in my life where I, I'm the good servant. I hope that's the majority of my life, that I'm the good servant. You know, I became a follower of Jesus when I was 19 years old, and I was radically transformed, man. God saved me, and it was a radical transformation. I realized right away that my life meant something, that it had purpose, and it was far greater than any earthly goal or strategy or plan that I had. It was well beyond that. And I learned early on that Jesus wasn't just part of my life. He was my life. Like, this was it. This was what my life was going to be about. Regardless of what I did for a career or whatever, wherever I went in life, it was going to be about Jesus and his kingdom. I was going to do his business. And I learned that early on. And, and I learned that Jesus is coming back for me someday. And he is expecting something. He's given me resources to do his business. And he's expecting a return, a return on that uh, investment. And you, so you know what I did? I got busy. <laughs> I got busy doing the king's business. I, I got busy working, going after it, connecting. Here's, a, here's the language we use here at Grace. I got busy connecting, growing, and going. I was connecting with Jesus, connecting to his church, connecting to others. I was growing in my relationship with the Lord as I got into his word and prayer and worshiping him. And then I was going to share the gospel, to make disciples. And that's been the majority of my life. And I've realized that my worship, it isn't about me. It isn't about what I get out of it. It's not about my reward either now or then. It's not about hearing the words, well done. It's not about any crown that I might get. It's about my king. It's about my king getting glory. And if I can get more done for him here that will give him more of a reward then, that will glorify his name, awesome. That's what it's about. But I gotta be honest with you. I've also been the wicked servant. And I've had seasons, far too many of them, where I've hidden the gifts of God. I've kept the resources that he's given me to myself and not shared them with anybody. I've kept the gospel from others by not telling them, simply out of laziness or fear or intimidation, whatever it might be, but I've kept it to myself. I've refused to surrender my resources, my finances, my time to share the gospel or make disciples, to be a blessing to others. Instead, I just wanted to benefit me. There are times in my life with Christ, sadly, where I've done nothing. Seasons where I've just done nothing to advance the kingdom. And that's not how I want to be found when the king returns. I don't want to be found doing nothing. I don't want to, I want to have rewards that are going to turn to his glory. See, Jesus is coming. Jesus is going to return to this earth. How are we preparing? Are we doing the king's business? Are we loving God? Are we loving others? Are we sharing the gospel? Are we making disciples? Jesus is going to reign. How are we preparing for that? 
Are we making gains? Are we expanding the kingdom, making disciples, serving others, worshiping Jesus with our life? Here's the last component. Jesus will judge the dead at his final judgment. Jesus will judge the dead at his final judgment. And we see this in Revelation 20, verses 11 and 12. He says, Then I saw a great white throne, and him who sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away. And there was found no place for them. There's no place to hide. There's nowhere to run from this. And he said, I saw the dead. And when he says the dead here, that's, that's those who have rejected Jesus, those who have rejected the gift of eternal life that Jesus offers through the cross and through his resurrection. He says, I saw the dead, both small and great, standing before God, and the books were opened. And these books are like ledgers of every thought, every word, every deed that's been done. He, says, I, he said, the books were opened and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the book of life is the Lamb's book. You see this over and over in the book of Revelation. Uh, you know, Revelation 3, Revelation 5, 13, 17, 21, you'll find the Lamb's book of life. And this is a book of names, not a book of works, not a book of actions, it's a book of names. Names of people who have surrendered their life to Jesus. Names of people who put their faith in Jesus and Jesus alone for their salvation. And now they are in the book of life. They have life. And he says, and the dead, this is uh, verse number 12, and the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. And if you jump down to verse number 15 of chapter 20, it says, and anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Now that's hard. That's hard to hear. That's hard to try to wrap your head around. But that's the reality. That is the reality. Jesus will judge the dead at his final judgment. The question is, how are you preparing for this reality? How are you preparing for this reality? Back to our, our parable one last time in Luke 19. One group of people that we didn't mention, he, G, Jesus mentions them at the beginning of the story. He said that there were people in his kingdom that, um, that were citizens. They were not servants, but citizens who hated him and said, we will not have this man reign over us. And at the end of the story, the king says, bring here those enemies of mine who did not want me to reign over them and slay them before me. Again, that's harsh. It's hard language, but it's the reality. The application is that these citizens are people who live in God's earth, his domain, citizens of the world, but who refuse to serve him. They're people who reject Jesus. They're the people who are saying, I will not have this man reign over me. I will not have this king reign over me. Jesus will not be my king. He has a way in which he wants me to live. He's offering me, I don't want any of that. I'm gonna live my own way. I'm gonna do my own thing. You see, God doesn't force his citizens to love him or to follow him. He offers everyone eternal life through Jesus Christ. He offers anyone who wants it eternal life, but he doesn't force them to take it. No one has to, has to do it. It's your choice to receive it or to reject it. If you choose not to have Jesus as your king now, he's going to honor the decision when he returns. You see, those who suffer eternal judgment are only receiving what they wanted all along, and that's separation from Jesus. They wanted it here on this earth, and they'll have it for the rest of eternity. And they'll be separated from everything that God is. God is hope, and he is love, and he is joy, and he's life, and he's light, and he's mercy, and he is forgiveness. He is all those things. And to be without him for eternity is to be without all of that. Now, I don't know if we're talking about a literal lake of fire here or if the lake of fire is just symbolic for the torment of being without God and all that he is. 
Either way, it's awful. Jesus will judge the dead at, at the final judgment. How are you preparing for this reality? If you're not a follower of Jesus yet, if you've not put your faith in Jesus Christ, if you've not received his gift of salvation, there is only one way that you can prepare for this final judgment, and that is to get your name in the book of life. Get your name written in the book of life, and there's only one way to do that, and that's to receive the gift of eternal life that the Lamb of God offered with his first coming. He offers every single one of us a chance at eternal life. And he's offering it to you right now. Is there anything right now that's keeping you from receiving the gift of eternal life that God has for you right now? If not, all you need to do is ask for it. All you need to do is ask for it. In fact, say this with me. In your own words, say something like this to God. Just say, God, I know I've sinned. I know I'm guilty. I know I deserve the wrath of God. I deserve the punishment that comes with sin. But I also know that Jesus Christ came into this world to take that sin for me and to take that wrath and that punishment for me. And I'm sorry he had to do that, but I'm confessing my sin and I'm asking you to forgive me of it. Please forgive me and save me, rescue me, give me your life. I wanna follow you with my life. Save me. Now, if you said something like that right now, we believe that you just entered into a relationship with Jesus Christ. We believe that your name is now written in the book of life. And man, we would love to celebrate that with you. We wanna, we wanna rejoice with the angels who are rejoicing right now. If you would do us a favor and just let us know. Right, right now, if you're watching this from our, our website platform, you'll see in the chat, the chat room a message that came up that says, I wanna become a follower of Jesus. Just click the button that says raise hand so we can celebrate that with you. If you're watching from a different platform, just text the word Jesus to 855-734-7223 because we wanna celebrate that decision with you. Now, if you are a follower of Jesus, how do you prepare for this reality? You do the king's business. Are you doing the king's business? If not, Today's a new day, let's get started. Let's get busy doing the king's business. Let's share the gospel. Let's love the Lord, let's love others. Let's make disciples. Aren't you glad that someone was doing the king's business in your world when you came to know Jesus, that someone shared Jesus with you? Because here's the deal, there's people in your sphere of influence right now whose names are not written in the book of life. And you know what that means. Let's do the king's business till he returns. Let's be outward focused followers of Jesus. Well, thanks so much for joining us this weekend for our online service. If you feel like God is stirring something in your heart, if you maybe want to learn about following Jesus for the first time, or if you can think of another step that you just want to take in your faith, that you want to take in becoming a part of our community here at Grace, I want to invite you. You can either text Jesus to the number on the screen, and we'll reach out with you with more information about what it looks like to follow Jesus, what it looks like to receive him as your personal Lord and Savior. If you go to visitgracechurch.com slash next step, we'll also reach out to you. We wanna help you feel connected here. We wanna help get you resourced. I mean, we wanna help give you opportunities and resources, whatever you may need to grow and to go. So connect with us. We love you. We're so glad that you're here and we can't wait to see you next week. Skeptical inside, making promises We both know our lies burn There's no need for pride when surrender wins the fight With victory in my bones I'll be singing till morning comes My heart can find its courage Cause I know Even when the night comes I'm not scared Cause even when the night comes I know you'll be there even when the night comes, my heart fails. I 
know, I know you'll always be there Even when the night comes Your love is stronger, your love is greater So what do I have to fear?